I took up a job as a night guard. I shouldn't have. Posted by Rick and Dick and Dak. When I first saw the ad, I didn't think twice. Earn up to $80 per night with our simple job as a night guard. No prior experience required. The ad said and I submitted my resume as fast as I could, fearing it could disappear or be taken by someone else at any moment. Not two hours after submitting my application, I got a response on my email that I'd been hired and can start working from tonight. It struck me as odd that there was no job interview and that I needed to start working right away. But hey, maybe they urgently needed someone. I've been jobless for over a year now, so I naively ignored any red flags and was just happy to have a job. I went to the given address at 8 p.m., and it turned out to be an office building. Hello? I called out when I entered, but no one responded. The hall I was in was engulfed in darkness, and the only source of light was coming through the pane of glass on the door which had the name security on it. I knocked on the door, but there was no response. I decided to open it, and sure enough, it was empty. On the desk was a note, left clear as day for me to read. It said, To the new night guard. Your shift starts at 8.04 p.m. and ends at 4.04 a.m. When you arrive to the building and relieve the other guard of your duty, you can stay in the security room as long as you want, but you have to use the elevator to get to the top floor once at any time during the shift. Once up there, you have to proceed to the end of the attic and flip the switch on the wall. That's it. If the other guard is not in the security room at the time of your arrival, make a report in the notebook and we will inform his family. As for your duty, it's very likely that when you push the top floor button, 25, the elevator will go past that floor and you may see that it stopped on floor 33. If this happens, do not try pushing any of the buttons since it will not work. Go forward through the hallway. Note that the flashlight may not do much to illuminate the area, but still bring it with you, there's a spare in the drawer. Some people report hearing or seeing office employees working at their desks, coming from any of the adjacent rooms. You may see them doing something like typing on a computer which isn't turned on, or typing one word over and over on the screen. Ignore them at all. Cost. It is currently unknown if the employees are real or a manifestation of the mind, but ignoring them should keep you safe. Turn left when you reach the end of the hallway. You may sometimes see a man standing in the middle, blocking your way. He will do you no harm, so long as you maintain eye contact with him. You have to get past him, so put your hand on the wall to your right, or left, and slide it across as you go through to avoid stumbling and losing eye contact with the man. He will keep following you with his gaze and try to distract you. Reports indicate he may point behind you with a look of fear on his face to try to get you to look away. You may also hear loud crashing sounds or voices right next to you, but ignore them. Once you reach the end of the hall and round the corner, and not a moment sooner, you're safe from the individual. When you reach the exit which leads to the staircase, proceed down. Make sure to note what floor you are on, and if any of the floors start repeating on your way down, immediately go back up to floor 33 and then start descending again. If you see any of the other stair doors open, proceed carefully, especially focusing on the ceiling or underside of the stairs. You may start to hear footsteps coinciding with your own behind you. Don't stop to listen and don't turn around, just proceed as you normally would. If you feel that the footsteps are getting closer, go faster, but try not to arouse suspicion. If you hear a high-pitched scream coming from above, it usually sounds like a mountain lion, Run down to floor 25 as fast as you can and pray you are faster than the thing chasing you. If you are forced to continue going down despite the floors repeating, enter the closest floor. You will find yourself back in the hallway of floor 33, so simply repeat the steps from before. Once you reach floor 25, you are in the clear. First, call the elevator and jam the door to keep it open. Press the floor 1 button and go back to the switch. After flipping the switch, the lights will go out. 
At this point, you will start to hear screams all around you, similarly to the one described before. Run to the elevator as fast as you can and enter it, while unjamming the door. If you did everything right, you should have at least 5 extra seconds to close the elevator before the entities of the building reach you. You should be back on the first floor of the security room once the elevator stops. You may spend the rest of the shift however you desire, so long as you don't leave the property between 8.04 p.m. and 4.04 a.m. Note that leaving the building at any given moment between the mentioned times will put you back on floor 33. Also note that not flipping the switch before 4.04 a.m. will result in you not being able to leave the building. Thank you for performing your duties. Management It's 1.24 a.m. right now and the elevator doors just opened on their own. I've been trying to leave my bathroom for the past 30 minutes. Posted by V0IDs I can't leave my bathroom. About 30 minutes ago I got out of the shower and dried off, put on my PJS, opened the door and walked out, only to find myself back in my bathroom, staring at the closed door. I stopped and tried to rationalize what had just happened to me. I convinced myself that I had simply imagined that I had opened the door and stepped out, so I tried again. I pushed the door handle down, opened it, stepped out, and yet again found myself in my bathroom, standing in front of a closed door. This has happened every single time I've tried to leave. I keep my phone in the bathroom with me when I'm showering I live alone so I keep it with me just in case, for safety. The first thing I did was call my parents my dad didn't pick up, but my mum did. I tried to explain the situation to her, but she couldn't seem to understand how I was trapped in my bathroom if the door could open. She seemed convinced that I must mean that my bathroom door's lock was broken and I was trapped inside. Regardless, she said that she would be over ASAP. She only lives a 15-minute drive away, so she should be here any moment. I'm sat leaning against my bathtub, looking out the open bathroom door into my landing. I opened it this time, but didn't try to step out. Everything looks normal. My bedroom door is closed just as I left it, the airing cupboard door closed as well, the stairs leading down to the hallway and the front door, all normal. The door is shut. I don't have any recollection of how it shut, when it shut only that it must have happened in the last few seconds after I wrote that last paragraph. I've just reread and reread that paragraph, it's proof that I'm not going crazy in imagining this. My mum just texted me to ask if I'm in the house. I said yes, of course I am, I'm trapped in the bathroom, that's the whole reason that I called you here. This is what she has sent. Mum, why aren't you saying anything? Me, what do you mean? Mum, are you even in there? Me, yes I'm in here. Are you here? Mum, I'm outside the bathroom door. I've been calling your name. I don't understand. I can't hear anything through the door. I'm going to open it. I can see my landing, my stairs, my front door, but no mum. I tried to walk out, but it was fruitless. Back staring at the closed bathroom door. My mum tried the handle of the door from her side, but it won't open. She brought tools to unscrew the lock. She says she's doing it now but I can't hear anything, and I can't see the handle moving. Okay, mum texts me to say the lock is taken out, but the door still won't open on her side. She looked through the circular hole in the door where the lock was, but just saw my bathroom. Empty. There's no hole on my side of the door. The handle and lock are intact. I have no idea what's happening, or how I can get out. After much convincing my mum that I am in fact in here, she said she is calling someone to possibly knock the door down. I'm worried that once they do that, they will find an empty bathroom, and yet I will still be here, trapped in my bathroom. There's no plug sockets in here, never mind my phone charger. My phone will die at some point, I'm already on 24%. When it runs out, 
I might lose my only point of contact with the rest of the world. I don't know what to do. Mum's left now to get help. I'm sat wondering what I can do. I tried to break the door down myself. I knew it wouldn't work, but I had to try. I remember reading once on Reddit that you shouldn't use your shoulder. You should try to kick the door by the lock because it's the weak point. It didn't work. I'm not sure any part of this door has a weak point now. The window is small, and I'm not sure if I'd actually be able to fit out of it. Scratch that the window won't open either. There are locks on the windows in my house. You can lock them with a little key, but I never received any when I moved in so I've never been able to lock them. It's locked now though. It's got one of those white plastic cheap blinds covering it. I ended up ripping it down. It's pulled some plaster down with it, but now I can get at the window better. It's straight above the toilet, so I am kneeling on top of the toilet lid, yanking at the window handle. It won't. Wait, it opened. I didn't notice how dark it was outside. It shouldn't be dark, it's midday. I looked around, desperately trying to see anyone. No one's around. Everything looks kind of muted. I can't describe it. Nor can I describe the deep-seated feeling of dread and wrongness as I look out into my neighborhood. My instincts are telling me not to, but I stick my head out to look down to where I could possibly drop to. My window's closed. I never felt myself move, but my window's closed. Even the fucking plastic blind is back in place. I'm sat on the floor now, as far away from the window and door as I can get. I feel sick. Mum came back, along with her work friend. He helped her unscrew the hinges and remove the door. I'm not in there. They can't see me. My mum sent a photo of her inside the bathroom, with no me. She thinks this has all been a joke and is refusing to reply to my texts or answer my calls. I'm on 14% battery. I don't know if I will ever get to leave. This might be my only chance to say goodbye to my mom, but she won't answer her phone. Edit. I've ripped down the shower curtain, and yet I'm staring at it right now, hung up, hanging over the side of my bath. I looked out the window again. I think I heard a rumbling. Low, quiet rumbling. I haven't opened the window since. My phone's on 1%. If I get out, I will update this post. If no edit comes, assume I'm still here. Mr. Mogi was imaginary. He had to be. Posted by Raiden N. My daughter started talking about Mr. Mogi on her fourth birthday. My brother and I lived across the street from one another, and we held the party at his house since he could afford a pool and I couldn't. That day, the shift was indicated by a small tug on the skirt. I turned to see the beautiful hazel eyes of Melissa, my daughter, staring up at me. Mommy, Mr. Mogi wants to come home with us. I knelt down to get to her level. Who's that, baby? She looked around, as if searching for someone. He's my new friend. I don't see him, though. He must have gone to grab his coat. I realized then that my little baby had her first imaginary friend. I nodded enthusiastically. Of course he can. Mr. Mogi is more than welcome in our home whenever he wants. I thought nothing of Mr. Mogi, really. Although, thing around the house were strange after that, and a lot of it had to do with Mr. Mogi. She insisted on having her window open every night, and Mr. Mogi never seemed to want to be in the room with me. Every time I'd ask her where he was, she'd say something like, He went home for the day. Or, He decided to go for a walk around the block. I once joking asked if he didn't like me. She looked at me, hurt. Oh no, mommy! Mr. Mogi loves you a whole bunch. He just gets shy. This went on for a year. The only problem was, the more time went on, the more immersed she became in Mr. Mogi. She changed a lot of parts of her personality, which she said was something Mogi wanted for her. My emotions were mixed. Worry and frustration. She would spend so much time by herself. 
opting to shut herself away in her bedroom with him rather than go spend her time outside. She refused certain things she used to love, and it was difficult to get her to even go to the store with me. I'd try to take her to her dad's on weekends, but if I could even get her there without her throwing an enormous fit, I'd get a call within a few hours from my ex-husband, absolutely insisting that I pick her up. She was out of control at that point. She trashed his house on several occasions before he finally threw his hands up and yelled, God damn it, Mary, take your fucking kid and get out of my life. She held her head in shame as I explained, while trying to contain my sheer anger, that what she did was entirely wrong. She just kept saying, Mr. Mogi said it was the only way I could stay with you. I felt fed up, but I was more worried. I wanted to badly to take her to a doctor, but the divorce left us broke and without insurance. Silently, I hoped she would grow out of it. One morning, I woke up to find that Melissa was fully dressed. Most of the time, she would opt for pajamas. What's the special occasion? I asked, treading lightly as possible. She had never flipped out and trashed our house, but I still found myself afraid of my own child. Mr. Mogi wants to play outside today. I nodded, relieved that she was going to be outside instead of locked away. I decided that I'd do the dishes, so I could stay inside and still watch her playing in the yard. I couldn't have looked away more than a few minutes, but when I looked back, she was gone. Running outside, I screamed her name, but got no reply. I called the police immediately and a search was started. Every hour that passed, I prayed to a God that I didn't fully believe in. I prayed for my daughter's safety. I prayed that this was just one of many odd but harmless occurrences. Hours turned into days, then weeks, months. Half a year had gone by, and there was no sign of Melissa. At 2.37 a.m. on an abnormally warm October night, a call came into the station from a man claiming to have seen someone carrying a body through his backyard. The police caught him in the act. Older man, probably in his forties. Thick glasses, lanky body. Nothing at all special about him, other than the fact that the body he was trying to bury was that of my little Melissa. I'm sure you don't want the gory details, and I'm not willing to relive them. She had been abused and disgusting, in human ways for the entirety of the six months she had been gone. She was so thin and bruised, she was barely recognizable. I was asked down to the station, and had my brother accompany me. They wanted to see if I could recognize the guy. My brother grasped my hand tightly, likely fighting back tears himself, as we stared at this strange man from behind weird mirror glass. It all felt like a bad episode of SVU. Detective Lorenzo stared with sympathy in his eyes. Do you know this man? I shook my head. No. I've never seen him in my life. My brother looked at me with confusion. What are you talking about? Don't lie to them, Mary. My head was so foggy, it took a few moments for me to realize what was said in reply. Ah, uh, no. I've never seen him. He looked a bit angry with me then. Are you shitting me? He was in and out of your fucking house for that past, what, year? That was the tipping point. Later, I sat at a metal table across from Detective Lorenzo. His tone had changed from sympathetic to accusatory. How do you know Tomas Mooney? He pushed a photo of the man that killed my daughter across the table. I shook my head, almost too bewildered to speak. I don't know that man. He stood quickly, slamming his hands on the table. Yeah, this definitely seemed like a bad episode of SVU. He was in your house. People saw him walking everywhere with you and your daughter. Your own brother saw the man come in and out of the house. I think that's when I made the connection. Mooney. Mooney. Mogi. Mogi. There was no way. Mr. Mogi was imaginary. It was not possible that a man could have avoided me been in my home with my child for a year. Yet, the evidence was there. The neighborhood watch had surveillance cameras installed a few years before we moved in. The footage showed Tomas Mooney, a man I never met until I saw him in that interrogation room, crawling through the windows of my home, 
mostly Melissa's bedroom window. Hell, he even came and went through the front door several times. They asked a few people around the community if they ever saw him. Most of them nodded solemnly. They all assumed that he was a relative or a family friend. He'd always follow at a distance, and I never thought to look over my shoulder. I never saw him. I never fucking saw him. Not once. My roommate and his the cat in the hat costume. Posted by Pross. It was the 1st of November, and he was still wearing it. Our party was on the 29th of October, and it was funny then, hell, even on the 30th it still made me laugh when I saw him occasionally creep out of his room to stock up on snacks from the kitchen. When I left the house for my 9am class on the 31st, and he was sitting in the kitchen with his cat in the hat costume still on. Well, then I began to worry. John was quiet at the best of times, not too many friends, and I wasn't a stranger to sitting in silence at meal times. This was different though. His unnerving smile was all I could really see of his face beneath the prosthetics and makeup. It didn't help that it was shitty homemade costume either. Visible stitching and discolored tufts of fur made it all the creepier. Our other flatmate had dropped out at the start of the semester, so it was just John and I for a long time. He wasn't an inherently weird guy before this either, quiet yes, but friendly enough. Don't you have classes to go to? I asked as I left for work on the second. He silently shook his head, not looking up from the book he was reading. Starting to get real fucking creepy round here, man. I muttered loud enough for him to hear as I shut the door behind me. I like it. I heard John bark with venom from the driveway. It was the night of the third when I finally cracked and phoned his sister. The white patches of the suit were beginning to yellow and there was an awful stench permeating around the house. She thought I was kidding at first, but after I explained in detail what had been going on the last few days she went quiet. She assured me that he had been texting her regularly as he usually did but had never mentioned the costume. I'd known the guy for a little over a year by that point, but I really didn't know that much about him. His sister told me that he'd been obsessed with the Cat in the Hat movie after he'd seen it in the cinema when he was eight or nine, but grew out of that phase pretty quickly. She assured me that she'd phone him and get to the bottom of whatever the hell was going on. It was the smell that woke me up, that's how pungent it was. Don't meddle with my affairs. John said standing in the doorway with a dim light behind him which partially illuminated that fucking costume. What the hell? Get out of here you freak! I shouted in a panic daze. Don't meddle with my affairs, he said again. His tone was calm but there was a definite aggression behind it. He lingered there for a few more seconds, a silent tension between us. It was one of the few times in my life I'd ever felt genuine terror as I gazed at that horrendous cat costume and my roommate beneath it. The next day in class I was going through my options in my head. My other friends had recommended calling the cops, and that John was in need of some serious help. I didn't want to get him into some kind of trouble though, maybe even sectioned. My choice was made for me when two police detectives pulled me out of the lecture. They sat me down in the cafeteria, with stern looks upon their faces. My first thought was that John had killed himself. I don't know why but that made the most sense to me. I was dead wrong. Why didn't you report that he was missing? Did you not find it odd for him not to come? One quizzed me. He, he isn't missing? He should be there right now, probably still wearing that stupid costume. A dog walker had discovered John's naked body in the bushes not far from my house. The police reckoned he'd been dead since the night of the 29th. They never found anyone in the house during their search, only that tattered costume which had been neatly folded on top of my bed. My wife has a removable face. I've never glimpsed what lies beneath it but my best friend has. Posted by Anselus. Samantha told me about it on our third date. 
We were watching a movie on her couch when I made my move to kiss her. She whipped her hand in front of my face and blocked me. There's something you need to know, she said. I braced myself. Here it comes. I'm not ready for a relationship. Nothing to do with you, of course. It was the absolute last thing that I wanted to hear, because I was already crazy about her. Okay, I said. I have a removable face. That's a new one. You have a what now? I was about to laugh, but she was wearing a deadly serious expression. I have a removable face. Is that like a metaphor or something? No. My face is literally removable. Look. Closely. She lifted her chin and traced her jawline with a finger. You can see the seam. After admiring how beautiful her neck was for a dizzying moment, I leaned in for an inspection. It was very hard to see, but it did look like there was a slightly unnatural transition. There from her face to her throat. I grew dizzier as a dozen questions rushed into my brain. Don't bother asking why or how or anything like that, said Samantha. I can't tell you that. If that's going to be a problem, you should leave now. I'm letting you know this because I like you, and I want to take the next step, but this is non-negotiable. Okay, I said unsure of what was happening. Not a problem. So what? You have a removable face. Who cares? It looks good. There's something else. Once a day, usually in the evening, I have to remove the face and disinfect the inside of it. If I don't, it will rot. This takes about an hour, give or take, depending on how my day went. During this time, you must never ever look at my real face. Never. Do you understand? Why, yes. Got it. Don't ask about it, don't look at your real face. Samantha stood up. Now I'm going to go into the bathroom and clean my face. That will give you plenty of time to think about what I've told you. If you're here when I'm done, that's great. I would like that. But if you're gone, I'll understand. She turned and walked into her bedroom. I sat in stunned silence as I heard the bathroom door close. I gave the thing some serious thought. It was possible that it was a joke of some kind. It was possible that it was a delusion. Was it possible that it was true? Well, it was certainly possible to transform an actor's face with movie makeup, so I supposed it was possible that Samantha wore a removable face every day. Maybe she had had a horrible accident where her flesh had been mangled. Maybe her face had been melted by acid, or burned by fire, or the skin shorn off by heavy machinery. If it had, I would never know, because she would never tell me, and I would never see it. I pictured a face of raw, naked muscle, rotting away. Could I kiss her, if that was what I was kissing? But wasn't that what we all were, under the skin? Just muscle and bone and blood and squishy organs. I paced around the living room, running my hand through my hair. I liked Samantha a lot. She was smart, and funny, and beautiful. But was that beauty real? Did it count? Did it matter if it was real or not? Was I being superficial even worrying about it? When she came out of the bathroom, I was still there. I looked at her face. She smiled and I was in love. Asterisk. We dated, we moved in together, we decided to get married. For the most part, it was a completely normal relationship, typical of two young people in love, building a life together. During the day, it was easy to forget about the face altogether. It looked natural enough, and only in certain positions, in certain lights, was there ever any indication that it wasn't natural. But every night was the same. Samantha would close herself in the bathroom, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for two, and clean the inside of her face. The curiosity never left me. I would sit there and wonder what was under that face. I came so close to barging in on her a few times, but I never did. I did occasionally ask her about it. About what, if anything, had happened. About how it was possible to make the removable face look so real. About what it really looked like underneath. 
I tried to coax her into showing me, assuring her that I loved her no matter what, and didn't give a damn what her real face looked like. I was just curious, that's all. She never showed me, or told me the story behind it. She didn't get upset at me, unless I was really badgering her. She'd just shrug and say, You know you can't see it. You know I can't tell you about it. Asterisk. I never told anybody about Samantha's removable face. It's not that she asked me not to. I just didn't think it was anybody's business. Except once, I did tell somebody. It was during my bachelor's party. We had rented several cabins in Big Sur and spent the night drinking and packing our noses with powders that we shouldn't have been packing our noses with. Everyone else had passed out and the sun was creeping up behind us as I stood on the majestic cliffs with my friend Chris, looking down on the Pacific waves crashing against the rocks. Chris was my best friend, as close to a brother as I'd known. We'd grown up together and visited each other at college often and spent the summers together. After college, we'd moved to different cities, but we stayed in close contact. Standing there on the cliffs, I told Chris about Samantha's removable face. At first, he thought I was joking. Then he had a thousand questions, most of which I couldn't answer. What's underneath? I don't know, man. I don't know. Doesn't that drive you crazy, not knowing? I shrugged. Lots of stuff I don't know. Don't know how to do calculus. And I don't know what happens when we die. But dude, she's about to be your wife. And you don't even know what she looks like. I mean, I'd have to take a look. Like you could set a camera up in the bathroom. That's where she does it, right? Set up a camera and have a look and then you'll know. I sighed. Yeah, it drives me crazy. I've asked her a million times. But she told me I could never look. Gotta respect that man, even if I don't like it. That's love. Chris laughed. You telling me to respect a woman? Up is down now. Then we fell back into talking about old times as a new day dawned. Asterisk Chris was in town for business last week and planned on spending the weekend at our house. The conversation at Big Sur had happened four years ago and we hadn't spoken about Samantha's removable face since despite keeping in close contact and seeing each other as often as two people transforming into adults in different parts of the country can. It happened on Saturday evening. We were lounging lazily in the backyard, deep into the beer, having just finished with some grilled steaks, when I got a text from work. God damn it. I groaned. I have to make a work call. Seriously? said Samantha, raising an artificial eyebrow. On a Saturday night? My biggest client, baby. Sorry. It is what it is, I guess, said my wife. I'm going to head inside and get cleaned up. Chris? Are you okay just hanging out for a bit? Chris smiled. I'll be fine. Got my beer, got some weeds to pull in your garden. God knows your lazy ass husband isn't going to do it. Those tomatoes are choking to death. It's a tragedy. I rolled my eyes and went into the side yard to make my call. Fifteen minutes into it, I heard the screams coming from inside. Both my best friend and my wife were wailing in terror. I dropped the phone and ran into the house and down the hall to our bedroom. Through the open door, I could see that the door to the master bathroom was also standing open. Don't come in, screamed Samantha. I don't have my face on. Call an ambulance. He looked. Oh God, he looked. She sounded desperate and truly horrified. That made me desperate and horrified, and I wanted to rush into the bathroom, but I knew suddenly that that would be a mistake. I knew suddenly that Samantha didn't want me to look at her real face not out of a sense of vanity, but for my own safety. Chris staggered backwards out of the bathroom. He was holding a straightened out paper clip, which he had used to pick the privacy lock. Now he was stabbing it again and again into his eyes, shouting gibberish. He was clearly in the depths of madness, and it turned my stomach to see him mutilate himself. Call a fucking ambulance, my wife screamed. Don't come in here. 
He fucking looked. I turned and ran back to the side yard, where my phone was lying in the newly mowed grass. My client was still on the line, alarmed, asking what was happening, what all the screaming was. I hung up on him and called 911. When the paramedics arrived, Chris was having a seizure in the hallway. Samantha was stroking his head, sobbing. Her face was on, but it had been done hastily, and everything looked a little off. Asterisk. My world has been dark this past week. My best friend is in a psychiatric hospital under suicide watch. He's completely blind and mostly catatonic, except when he slips into a violent, babbling mania. The doctors are optimistic that his state is temporary, but they don't know the truth about what caused it, because I told the paramedics that Chris had taken a large dose of psychedelic mushrooms and fallen into psychosis. I saw no good reason to tell the truth about what had happened. Who would believe that one look at my wife's, real, face would make somebody insane? At best, we would be the subjects of a long investigation. At worst, we would have to prove that what we were saying was true, by showing somebody Samantha's face. Then the same thing would happen again, and what after that? I had no idea, and no interest in finding out. For Samantha's part, I knew that she would never consent to show anybody her real face, no matter what the consequences of refusal were. I did get a follow-up call from the police, asking me to confirm my story. The hospital found no traces of psilocybin in Chris' blood, though that's not unheard of, since it has a short half-life. If they end up testing his hair, I will likely be in a lot of trouble. But that's truly the least of my concerns. Samantha is in a state of her own. She still cleans the inside of her face, though not as regularly, and when she puts it back on, it's always crooked now. It is beginning to smell a little bit. I've tried to assure her that it wasn't her fault. He knew, I said. I told him that nobody was ever allowed to look at it. He knew and then he broke into the bathroom. This is not on you, baby. Please, talk to me. Not on me? That one look at my fucking face makes people insane? Please, I just need some time alone. As for me, I am doing my best to hold it together. Do you know what's strange though? Despite what happened to Chris, I still find myself curious about what my wife's real face looks like. More curious than ever, really. No sleep for the innocent. Posted by, won't think straight. The most remarkable thing about David was just how unremarkable he was. Though a very decent man by any measure, he lacked any distinguishing traits that would have stood him out from a crowd. It was this initial bias that almost made us pass over his story without digging further. Like many people, David was struggling with the world. His wife Laura had died from cancer four years ago, and he juggling between making ends meet while raising his two sons on his own. His eldest, Joel, was seventeen and a handful on the verge of being an adult, and with the typical rebellious streak that made many a father's life a trial. Seesawing between sullen withdrawal or straight-out bursts of teenage angst, he was often as much a hindrance as a help to the household. David often feared it was just a matter of time before he'd find Joel behind bars. But it was hard to find the time to be the fatherly role figure he wanted and needed to be. David's other son, Adam, was the opposite but in no less need of attention. Nine years of age, quiet and withdrawn, he was painfully shy and seldom spoke since Laura's death. David always felt guilty that he wasn't able to be there more for his children, but he was doing the best he knew how. Parenthood didn't come with a manual for him, and he was painfully ill-prepared for it, even after seventeen years. Laura had always been the natural parent. In the past year, he had taken out a large mortgage and moved his family to a better neighborhood. Unfortunately, the financial pressure meant that he now had to work two jobs to make ends meet. His main role was as a security guard from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., five nights a week. It was the only job he'd known, and he was good at it. 
Burdened with his larger debts, he now has other nights stacking shelves at a local grocery store. He didn't enjoy it, but it was money. And there aren't many choices of jobs for when he was awake. In the mornings when he came home from work and could beat the morning rush hour, he would occasionally see his kids briefly at the breakfast table. Otherwise, he would catch them in the evenings when they came back from school as he was preparing for his next shift. He was stuck in vicious cycle of financial slavery that brought him guilt, stress and anxiety, but we soon discovered that money wasn't the source of his problem. It had all started a year ago when David came home from a shift, only to find Adam holding back tears at the breakfast table. Joel was in his own world, head banging with his headphones plugged in, obliviously eating his cereal. Concerned, David sat down next to Adam, hugged him and asked what was wrong. That only made Adam burst into sobs. Hey! Hey listen champ chin up! It's okay! I'm here now! Tell me what's wrong! Adam opened his mouth, but after several moments, failed to say a word. Hey buddy, if you don't want to talk about it now, let's chat about it when you come home from school today, okay? Whatever's wrong, we'll fix it. David comforted Adam tenderly. He gave Adam his lunch money, walked both his sons to the door, and watched them set off for school. Exhausted, he took off his shoes and went straight to bed. That evening when his sons returned, David wanted to continue his chat with Adam. Please, please stay at home tonight, Dad. Don't go to work. Please. Why, champ? Is something wrong? Is Joel hurting you? Adam nervously shook his head. No, it's just please stay home, Dad. Don't go to work. David laughed. I wish I didn't have to, son. I wish I could spend more time with you boys. But there are bills piling up, and someone needs to put food on the table for you growing boys. I can't trust your brother to do that just yet. I can't even trust him to know what a can opener looks like. He must up Adam's hair and kissed him lightly on the forehead. Do your homework then get to bed, son. I'll see you in the morning, okay? A few weeks later as David was preparing dinner, Adam returned home from school with a bruise on his face. David glanced at Joel, who only rolled his eyes and gave in. I had nothing to do with it. Shrugged before slouching off to his room. Hey buddy, what happened? Is someone bullying you at school? Your teacher called today. She said she was worried because you haven't been having any lunch for the past couple of weeks. Is someone taking your lunch money? Adam simply shook his head and pleaded again for his dad to stay at home. The following week, David was woken from his sleep by loud poundings at the front door. Groggily, he opened it to be confronted with inspectors from Child Protective Services. Adam's teachers had noticed more and more bruises on his body. Coupled with his lack of lunch, they were deeply concerned that David was abusing him and keeping him malnourished. David was shocked and outraged with indignation. He responded that they should be investigating the school instead for allowing his son to be bullied, assaulted and robbed while the teachers did nothing. After several hours of intense questioning and searching every corner of the house, the agents found nothing conclusive. They left with a warning that they'd return if there was any indication that Adam continued to be abused. It was with weariness and concern when David was again interrupted in his sleep by the phone. It was from the principal's office, and they wanted to see him immediately. Rushing to the school, he found Adam with his head bowed, sitting next to a fuming family. Adam had been caught stealing $10 from another student. When confronted, had lashed out and hit the other child. David apologized profusely and made Adam do the same. David wondered where he had gone wrong as a parent. When they got home, David sat Adam down and simply said, Adam, I'm very disappointed in you. I know I haven't been a good father and been around for you as much as I'd like, but I try. God knows that I try to do good by you. I would have expected this kind of behavior from Joel, but not you. What's he asking you to do while I'm not around? Did he make you do this? Adam again shook his head and choked back tears. Dad, please stay home with me. Please don't go to work tonight. He pleaded. Why did you do it then? 
Why did you steal that boy's money? Because I, I didn't want you to have to go to work tonight. I want you to stay with me. Son, look, you know I have to work. Before David could finish his sentence, Adam jumped up and ran to his room with tears streaming down his face. He returned a few moments later cradling a tattered shoebox in his hands. Removing the lid, he gave the box to David. Inside were a collection of coins and notes. Several hundred dollars in loose change. Every single dollar that David had given Adam to buy his lunch. See, Dad? You don't have to work tonight. I've been saving your money. Is this enough so? You can stay home tonight? David was speechless. It was his turn to burst into tears as he pulled Adam in close for a tight hug. Of course, son. You're my boy. Of course I'll stay home tonight with you. I've been a bad father. I haven't been here enough for you. Tonight we'll do whatever you want. Anything. Adam looked his father in the eyes for several moments, as if trying to find the right words to say. Finally, he stuttered. Dad, I, I just want you to watch over me when I sleep. David was a bit surprised by this request. Uh, sure, buddy. Are you sure? Why? Adam stared at his feet for a few more moments, almost too embarrassed by the reason. Almost imperceptibly, he whispered, So the skeleton man in the ceiling won't attack me. David called in sick that evening and watched as his son slept. It was an exceedingly odd request and completely frightening. But the again, what nine-year-olds don't have overactive imaginations about the dark? David didn't find it an unpleasant task, though. He hadn't watched Adam asleep since he was a few months old. He had forgotten how much he missed it. It brought back unbidden a whirl of memories. The first night Laura and Adam came back from the hospital, the lullabies David would sing to make Adam sleep, how he watched Laura tuck the boys in every night. Adam and Joel had both grown up so quickly, and he spent so much of his life away from them that it seemed he woke up one morning only to find strangers at the breakfast table. He missed Laura terribly and wished she was here to watch their boys grow. He missed the way she made smiley faces with the eggs and bacon in the morning for the kids. He missed coming home to her warmth that made it feel like home. He definitely missed how her lips tasted of coffee when he kissed them when he returned from his night shift. But more than anything, he missed talking to her. He needed her to tell him that he was doing a fine job that she would be proud of what their sons would grow up to be, that she would be proud of the sacrifices he was making so their kids could have a better life. He knew he needed to be there more for his sons. The night soon faded as the first glimmers of sunlight streamed through the window. Adam slowly woke to see David still watching over him, smiling, eyes still moist with tears. Good morning, champ. David beamed. Good morning, dad. Adam rubbed his eyes. Is everything okay? Everything's great, son. Did you sleep well? Yeah. Adam yawned. Did anything happen last night? No. I watched you all night. You slept like a baby. David smiled again. You're a good night watchman, Dad. Adam joked. Ha ha, yeah? I'm the best, buddy. But it's also because there's no such things as monsters under your bed, or skeletons in your ceiling. Yes, you're right. A voice hissed. David's heart skipped a beat as he watched Adam gasp, staring at something behind his head. David could hear a scraping sound above him, like bones scuttling rapidly against wood. He quickly turned around in time to see the remains of a dark figure darting from the ceiling out the door, and a fading voice whispering, See you again, Sasun. David still chooses to work the night shift. It's the only way he can be sure he's awake for if, and when, it returns. Notes Posted by Won't Think Straight Having just shared with Brad the write-up story of his story, he's told me of another that's absolutely floored me. It's about his cousins, and the tragic tale of their daughter Emily. As per usual, all names have been changed to protect their privacy. 
Emily was always something of a mystery to her family. Always very quiet and thoughtful, she never had the childhood exuberance an 11-year-old should. In school, her natural reservedness made it very difficult for her to form any friendships with other children. For the first couple of years, her parents thought it might just be a phase of natural shyness. But as the years went by, they started to worry about her social awkwardness. They tried enrolling her in different classes and getting her involved in sports. They sacrificed their time and precious savings doing what they could to help her make friends. But she seemed happiest when she was alone, playing with her dolls. None of the other children wanted to play with her because they thought she was weird. And deep down, Emily's parents felt it too. There was a certain oddness to her, a mix of adult seriousness and emotional detachment. It didn't help that the few times that Emily spoke, it would be about events in the future. And they always seemed to come true. They first noticed it when Emily was six and was taken doll shopping. She paused outside the door of the doll store and refused to walk in. When asked why, she replied, It's hot mommy and all the faces are melted. Within that hour, an electrical fault had sparked which burned down the premises. Emily knew when their pet dog would get hit by a car and when they'd have to put him down. She knew that the neighbor's tree would fall and collapse on their home during a fierce storm. What worried her parents most, though, was how certain Emily was that she'd be dead before she was twelve. It broke her parents' hearts to watch her playing alone with her dolls. How she would talk with them about how she won't be around, and to not worry because mommy and daddy will look after them. Sure enough, shortly before her twelfth birthday, Emily suffered a brain aneurysm that she never recovered from. She was in a coma for several days before dying in hospital with her weeping parents at her bedside. It took several weeks for her parents to pull themselves back together enough to continue with their lives. When they entered Emily's room for the first time since her death, they noticed a handwritten note on the table for them. In Emily's large scrawl, it said simply, Dear Mom and Dad, I love you. Thank you for everything. Love, Emily. Over the next few months, they found more notes, hidden throughout the house. Each would be written on different scraps of paper, but always in her familiar blue scrawl. Under a dollhouse. Dear Mom and Dad, sorry I couldn't stay longer. Don't blame yourselves. It's not your fault. Love, Emily. On the back wall of the closet. Dear Mom, tell Dad I miss his bedtime stories. Love, Emily. Behind cereal boxes in the pantry. Dear Dad, Mom loves you very much and worries about how hard you work. Spend more time with her. Love, Emily. In an old briefcase. Dear Mom and Dad, sorry I didn't say I love you enough. I always have and always will. Love, Emily. Knowing she was going to die. Emily had hidden dozens of messages for her parents to find over the years as reminders of her, saying all the things she couldn't seem to when she was alive. Each note her parents found was treasured and lovingly collected and stored in a heavy wooden box. But there was one note they found that seemed out of place. While it seemed to be in her handwriting, unlike the others, it was in signed and used a blood-red ink. On it was simply written Uncle Scott. Puzzled, they added it to box at the exact moment Uncle Scott knocked on the door to check on them. They smiled and put it down to coincidence. Until a few weeks later when they discovered a second note in the same red ink, Bad Man. Feeling uneasy, they double-checked the locks on their doors that night. In the morning, they found their back door lock broken it was only the chain lock they had secured that stopped whatever intruder from getting in. A few more weeks pass and they uncovered the next red ink note behind a photo on the mantelpiece. On it was written, In my room. Curious, they went to Emily's room and searched. Since Emily's death, they had carefully cleaned and maintained it to be exactly the same as when Emily was alive. They thought they had checked every corner for notes. They checked again under the bed, and found one in red ink stuck to the mattress. Behind closed doors. Curious, they closed Emily's bedroom door. 
Stuck to that door was a poster of puppies that Emily had liked when they first got their dog. The rattle from the door closing loosened and dropped the poster, revealing a chilling fifth note. He will suffer. A wave of uneasiness hit Emily's parents, and they scrambled back out to the kitchen for a drink. At that moment, the doorbell rang as Scott paid his regular visit. He asked why they seemed so rattled, and was told of the note behind the door. Scott asked to see it, and went into Emily's bedroom while her parents stood shaking in the kitchen. The door to Emily's room suddenly slammed shut with so much force the house shook. Scott's screams then filled the air, mixed with the sounds of crashing and banging. Emily's parents rushed to the room, but nothing they could do would open the door. The sound of Scott's screams became louder and more frightening, along with unearthly guttural noises like some wild beast was in there with him. After several minutes of trying to break into the room, everything suddenly became still. Only Scott's quiet wailing could be heard as the door opened normally. He was lying in a fetal position, rocking backwards and forwards whilst repeating, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Scott would never speak of what happened in that room, but he later confessed to having sexually abused Emily since she was five. He had threatened her to keep quiet, and Emily became withdrawn as a result. He was arrested and imprisoned for his reprehensible acts. On the day he was sentenced, Emily's parents opened their box of letters to remember what Scott had deprived them of. It was then they noticed that all the red ink letters were torn from the same complete sheet of paper. Uncle Scott. Bad man. In my room. Behind closed doors. He will suffer. It's been several months since that day, and no more notes have shown up. Emily's parents found some level of comfort and closure to their grief. Until a few days ago, when they found a new note, under a rug, in red ink. S-E-Y-O-U-S-O-O-N. Numbers. Posted by Danielle Hamilton. I was born with a gift. At least, that's what my parents always referred to it as. Personally, I wouldn't call it a gift, more of a knowing. An observational skill, if you will. I still remember how for the longest time I would see these things, these numbers, and have no idea what they meant. But now I know. I think I was around 11 years old when I first came to understand what the numbers meant. I was watching television with my parents when a news bulletin came on about a woman in Oxford who had been sentenced for the murder of 17 people. As I watched the footage of her being escorted into the courtroom, there it was. The number 17 floating just above her head like a halo of evil. In that moment I realized these numbers weren't random. They represented people. Every number I saw would signify the number of people that person would kill in their lifetime. I saw the world very differently after that day. On a normal day, walking through school and on the way home, I would see a sea of zeros, maybe a few ones. Sometimes I would walk past a man in the street, the number three floating above his head making me feel uneasy. I didn't know anyone personally with anything higher than a one and would always convince myself that those ones would be due to a car accident or something of the sort, nothing as sinister as murder. As I grew older, the numbers remained mostly consistent. By this time I had told my parents about my sight, and we had agreed between us that it would be safer to keep the facts to ourselves. The first person I knew personally with a larger number was my friend Kyle. I met Kyle at a house party one of our mutual friends was throwing. We hit it off pretty quickly due to having a lot of the same interests, but I was always very uneasy when I would look at him and see the number 5 looming above his head. Five people? Kyle? It didn't seem possible and I very quickly decided that I didn't want to question it. About three months into our friendship, I woke up one morning to a number of messages on Facebook. All of my friends were frantic about what happened to Kyle but I couldn't get a straight answer out of any of them about what exactly had happened. After scrolling down a couple of posts on my news feed though, I had my answer. Kyle had gone to a party with his girlfriend, Amy. 
They'd gotten pretty drunk but Kyle decided he was still okay to drive home. About a mile into the journey he crashed into an oncoming car after veering into the wrong side of the road. The post said that the crash was pretty bad and his girlfriend had died instantly. Jesus Christ, I thought. As shocking as this news was, part of me couldn't help but feel guilty. I had known Kyle would kill someone, but I couldn't have known who or when. Right. As I read further into the posts, I found out more about the car Kyle drove into. Their car had flipped from the impact and rolled into a ditch on the side of the road. The driver, a fellow student at our school, had been killed instantly. His three friends who were in the passenger seats had all died in the hospital from their injuries. Five people. Kyle killed five people that night. And I knew it was going to happen. I carried the guilt of that accident around with me for a long time. I tried to talk to my parents about it, and they tried to empathize with me. But I knew they didn't understand. In fact, it was very hard for anyone to understand why I was feeling like that, until I met Melanie the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. We started dating about eight months after Kyle's accident, and I felt a connection with her that I'd never felt with anyone. She was the first person after my parents that I had ever told about my gift, and I was so relieved when she didn't freak out and leave me. She was so kind to me and so understanding about it. She was so curious about it and seemed to have an endless stash of questions. I was a little caught off guard when she stared at me, wide-eyed and asked me what number was above her head. She was a zero. I told her this, and it was almost as if I could see a little wave of relief wash over. Her. I loved all the questions she would ask. It felt good to finally be able to talk to someone about it, and to have them be genuinely interested in what I had to say. We'd been dating for about a year when she asked me something that my parents had never asked. Jamie? Can I ask you something? She asked sheepishly. Yeah, of course. I replied. Well, I always wanted to ask you this, but I could never find the right moment cause it always seemed a bit too personal. Come on, I'm sure by now nothing you could ask me would be too personal, Dot. I chuckled. Well, okay. I was just wondering, when you look in the mirror do you see a number above your own head? She looked up at me curiously, her big green eyes fixing on me. Actually, yeah? When I look in the mirror I see the number 13. I told her, looking down at my feet. Oh my god! She whispered as she took a step back. Are you serious? No, of course I'm not serious. I replied, unable to stop the smile growing on my face. I'm a zero, just like you. Melanie and I married a little over two years ago, and just a couple of days ago we welcomed our first baby into the world. A beautiful, healthy baby girl, Elizabeth. I've never known a love quite like the one that I feel when I gaze down at her little face. The feeling I get in my chest when her tiny hand clasps around my finger is unlike any other. I watch my wife fall more and more in love with our daughter every time she looks at her. I don't know how to tell her. I don't know how to tell her that when I look at our sweet, perfect baby, I feel my insides tighten with guilt. Because when I look just above her darling little face to the space just above her head, I see the number 148,327. The biggest number I've ever seen in real life. I also don't know how to tell her that on the day Elizabeth was born, the number I see on myself in the mirror had turned from a zero to a number one. 